Hello, AP Bio. This is our video lecture for Chapter 4, A Tour of the Cell. Um, chapters 2 and 3, we had to divide into two video lectures because they were pretty lengthy chapters. Chapter 4 is still a very important and very meaty chapter, but I'm going to try and get the video down to, or to one video. So here we go. So as is our tradition, I've begun with the picture. This is my son, Jack. This is taken a couple years ago. He is, um, this is at, at breakfast, and he's, he, was, he still is, but back in, when this picture was taken, he was going through a growth spurt. And he was a very, 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 very healthy eater. And you can see here, um, he's got a, a waffle in one hand, which is dipping in syrup, and he's got grits in the other hand. He's eating a bowl of fruit. What you can't tell from the picture is he's already eaten his breakfast in this picture. And what he's eating now are the remnants of the rest of our, um, the rest of our meals. So Jack was, Jack was a, a very healthy eater, and he was a, a growing boy. So I picked this picture because, um, you know, he was going through a growth spurt here. And, you know, all of us have gone through growth spurts. You are all at one point just a single cell. You are a zygote. And since then, you have grown a lot. But you're not just one big zygote. When an organism grows, the cells get to a certain size um, to where they divide. They go through mitosis, in the case of, of animal or plant cells, and they form two cells, then four, then eight, and so on. Um, so, you know, the cell is the basic unit of life. It's the smallest thing um, that we categorize as life that can carry out life functions. Everything that we have discovered that's alive is made of at least one cell, um, if not billions of cells, and cells only come from pre-existing cells. Um, of course, it doesn't answer the question where the first cell came from, but cells on Earth today um, only come from pre-existing cells. So the task of this chapter is to basically go through some cell biology, um, largely the, the organelles, the parts of a cell. So really, really quick, you don't need to know different kinds of microscopes for the AP exam, but it's worth just for just a minute or so to go through the, the different types. Uh, most cells are between one and 100 micrometers. A micrometer is um, 10 to the minus six, so a millionth of a meter. Um, light microscopes, which are what we use in our laboratory, are microscopes that allow, um, they use lenses and they allow light to pass through the sample usually. Um, to magnify it. Um, light microscopes can magnify usually effectively up to about a thousand times. And a thousand times is plenty good enough to see um, cells, chromosomes, parts of a cell, um, chloroplast, mitochondria. If you want to see ribosomes, you probably need a more powerful microscope. Um, the difference between magnification and resolution and contrast, again, you don't need to know this for the AP exam, but magnification is obviously how much it magnifies. Resolution is basically like sort of the crispness of the picture, the clarity of the, of the image, how well can you distinguish two, two points that are next to one another. You could have great magnification, but really lousy resolution. Um, and in contrast, you could have, you know, eh, magnification, but really good resolution and actually get a pretty good image. Contrast is just looking at like what's in the background, like how well do the, um, do the images pop out. Sometimes we use um, dyes, chemical stains to stain cells so that they pop in the image. Um, electron microscopes are microscopes that scan a surface with a beam of electrons, and you basically get a, a computer image. You're not seeing the actual image. You get a computerized image, kind of like, you know, using sonar to find, you know, the wreck of the Titanic or whatever. The electrons bounce off the object um, and come back to a detector. Scanning electron microscopes or transmission electron microscopes are two different types. Don't worry about the difference. Um, the disadvantage of an electron microscope, though, is is because electrons are so small, because they would also bounce off air particles, the sample has to be under a vacuum. So you're not gonna see cells that are living. Um, you're gonna see cells that are preserved. So if you wanna watch a bacteria actually actively dividing, a light microscope would be your best bet. Um, just some images from your book. Um, you can see the sample has been stained with a red dye so you can see it. Phase contrast, differential interference contrast. Don't worry about these terms, just, just some great images. Um, these are some images, these are great with a confocal microscope where you can see more than one layer in focus. Um, this image, they've stained the cells or parts of the cell with a dye that fluoresces that actually gives off light so you can see the different features. Um, cells, you know, aren't usually colored like this. Chloroplasts are green, chloroplasts are actually green, but usually cells are just kind of this image, just kind of a, an opaque, bleh. Okay, um, some other great electron microscope images of cilia. 
Okay, so this is a concept that we're gonna go through pretty quickly. So cell fractionation, so you've probably seen this before with, with blood samples where they take a blood sample and they spin it in the centrifuge really fast and you end up with a, a red pellet at the bottom, um, which is the red part of your blood, the red blood cell part. And then there's a, a kind of a light yellow fluid on the top, which is called plasma, which is the liquid part of your blood. Spinning things in a centrifuge basically separates things based upon size. And if you look at the image here, what they've done um, is they've spun a sample. This is the, the same sample, basically. Um, for longer periods of time at faster speeds, this G does not stand for gram. That just stands for how fast you're spinning it. Um, and heavier things separate first. So first they spun it for 10 minutes. This is just some kind of tissue sample. And you get a pellet at the bottom, a solid part, which just contains the nucleus and other parts of the cell. Then you take the liquid part that's left and spin that down and keep doing it in sequence. And every time you do it, you separate out smaller parts. So here you separate it out, mitochondrial chloroplast, here parts of the cell membrane, and finally you get ribosomes. So this sort of cell fractionation, this differential spinning allows you to separate out the parts of the cell. Okay, so prokaryotes and eukaryotes, so this is super important. Um, in a nutshell, prokaryotic cells are bacteria and they do not have a nucleus. The, the three domains of life, domain bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, we're gonna cover this in a later chapter, but domains bacteria and archaea are what we would sort of normally call bacteria. They're all single cell, they don't have nucleus, they don't have membrane-bound organelles. Um, domain eukarya are things, well, there's four kingdoms, protists, fungi, animals, and plants. They do have a nuclei. Um, you can get multicellularity, although some, you know, some fungi and protists are single cell. Um, they're more complicated. Um, the prokaryotic eukaryotic division, super important. Prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. They don't have nuclei. Eukaryotic cells do. Um, we're going to go through the parts of a cell and discuss what has each, but it's useful at the beginning to just mention parts of a cell that all cells have. All right? Um, plasma membrane, the cell membrane, all cells have. A semi-fluid substance called the cytosol, all cells have. Chromosomes, at least one, all cells have chromosomes. Ribosomes are parts of a cell that make proteins. If you can't make proteins, you're not gonna last very long, so all cells have ribosomes. So this little list of, of four, and we could probably add some more, are parts of a cell that all cells have, okay? Okay, we don't get into prokaryotes that much in chapter four. Um, just point out, they don't have a nucleus. Um, the region between um, what's inside the plasma membrane you call the cytoplasm. The cytosol is the fluid part that makes up the cytoplasm. Um, bacteria usually have one circular chromosome. Um, it's highly folded, but if you stretch it out, it looks like a circle. Um, and what's called the nucleoid region, which is usually toward the center of the cell. Um, the term membrane-bound organelles, this is an important term. So organelles is just a word for a, a part of the cell. Membrane-bound means there's a membrane around it. So a membrane-bound organ now would be like the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast, the ER, things that are in the cell that have membrane, have their own membranes around them. Ribosomes, this is an important distinction. Ribosomes are parts of a cell, right? Different cells have them, but they're not bound by a membrane. They're not membrane-bound, all right? So when we say that prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles, let's be specific, they can still have ribosomes because ribosomes aren't membrane-bound. Okay, so having this fancy membrane system is something that eukaryotic cells have, prokaryotic cells do not. Um, I just said this, eukaryotic cells have DNA inside a nucleus. Um, they have membrane-bound organelles. We're gonna go through all of them in this chapter. They have cytoplasm between the nucleus and the cell membrane, and they're usually much larger than um, bacteria or prokaryotic cells. Just a, a factoid, the root karyo, I don't know if it's a Greek or Latin, the root karyo means nucleus. So pro, pro can mean before or first. So prokaryotic means before there's a nucleus, so those cells came first. The root eu in Greek or Latin, the root u means good or true. So this word in Greek means true nucleus, okay? Prokaryotic means before nucleus. Okay, so plasma membrane. Uh, we're gonna go through the plasma membrane more in a, in a different chapter, but it's basically the barrier of the cell. All cells have a plasma membrane or just cell membrane. It's a selectively permeable membrane. Some things get through, some things don't based upon their size or their polarity. Oxygen, CO2 gets through fine. 
DNA does not because it's too big. Um, it's sort of what dictates what can and cannot come into the cell. Um, it's a bilayer of phospholipids. We discussed this in chapter three. Um, again, we're going to come back to the plasma membrane in a, a later chapter, but all cells have them. Um, so this is a good question. Why are cells so small? You know, you don't have cells the size of, of people. So if you think of to a geometry class or any other math class, so formulas for surface area is always something squared, right? Um, formulas for volume is always something cubed, okay? So think about what happens as a cell gets bigger. Um, as a cell gets bigger, the surface area gets bigger. I mean, duh. The volume gets bigger, duh. But which one gets bigger faster? The volume grows, <clears throat> excuse me, by a proportion of, of something, a diameter usually, cubed. Whereas, <clears throat> excuse me, the surface area grows by something squared. So the volume grows bigger um, or faster than the surface area does. So think of it this way. The surface area is like the wall of a cell, all right? The amount of surface area you have dictates how much stuff can get into the cell, right? Um, the volume is how much of the cell that you have to nourish. You have to get oxygen in your cells to every bit of the cytoplasm, all right? So if there isn't enough surface area to accommodate enough oxygen coming in, the cell is going to die, all right? So the bigger the cell gets, the bigger the volume gets, faster than the surface area, and the surface area isn't big enough to feed the cell um, as in get enough stuff in it. So when cells get to a certain size, they divide. This is a picture from your book. So this just shows a cube. Um, doesn't show me, you know, just one, I don't know, a centimeter, one whatever. Um, we're not gonna worry about the math equations in this, in this lecture. We'll do some math with this in class. But um, the surface area here is six. The volume here is one. The surface area to volume ratio, this is a very important number. It's a ratio of the surface area to the volume. So six divided by one is six you want this number to be big or, or you want it to be as big as it can be if i blew up this cube by a factor of five do the math the surface area becomes 150 the volume becomes 125 they both got bigger but the volume got bigger way faster the surface area to volume ratio is 1.2 and that's lousy that that's not good enough right you want the number to be big um same overall shape but sort of partition it into the little cubes like they were here the um the volume's the same, but because you have more surface area, look what happened to the ratio. It went back up to six. So having cell shapes that maximize the surface area to volume ratio by increasing the surface area is, is good. That's a plus. Think about like the lining of your intestines or, or any kind of membrane that's highly folded, highly convoluted. Having all those folds increases the surface area. A good analogy is when you, if you, if you buy towels, Really cheap towels are really, really kind of thin. Nice, expensive towels are like sort of, what's the word, kind of fluffy. Well, the fluffier they are, that's more surface area of the little like threads in the towel. It's going to absorb more water. It's going to dry you off better. So cheaper towels that aren't as fluffy have less surface area, so they don't dry you off as well um, when you get out of the shower or get out of the, of the pool. Expensive towels literally have more fabric. There's more fluff, so there's more surface area. Okay, same with cells. You want lots of surface area. Okay, all right, gang, we got to go through all the parts of a cell. Okay, we're going to do this kind of fast, so buckle up. So this is an animal cell. We're going to go through all the parts. This is a plant cell. Both these are eukaryotic cells, right? With plant cells, just notice we have a cell wall. We have um, chloroplasts, things that the animal cell does not have. Okay, so this is just some great images. Cells lining the uterus, um, yeast cells dividing. This is the cross section of a yeast cell. You can see the parts of a cell. This is a cross section, or uh, actually, it's not a cross section. It's just, no, this is a cross section of uh, duckweed, which is a plant. You can see the chloroplast. Um, okay, so we're going to go through the parts. At, you know, at times, you might need to pause the video if you're taking through filling out the lecture outline because we're going to go through this at a brisk pace. So nucleus. The nucleus is actually a double membrane. There's two phospholipid bilayers. The point of the nucleus, obviously, is to contain the DNA. Um, you don't want DNA to get messed with. So you keep it nice and safe in a nucleus. Um, you know, the DNA doesn't leave the cell, but RNA does. And there might be some times when you need to get some molecules into the nucleus. The nu nucleus does have little pores. 
these are kind of cool little like i don't know cool little star or flower shaped structures that are pores that allow ribosomes to come in and out to allow rna to come in and out um dna this is a later chapter but dna is basically a long linear shoestring like molecule it's wound up very tightly kind of like you wind up thread into a spool um the in this picture the little blue thread is dna and the little purple balls um is is protein they're called histones that the dna wraps around and the structure collectively makes a chromosome so dna is nucleic acid chromatin is what you call it when you wind it around um the proteins just for structure and we nice wind it up nice and tight and condense it that you call a chromosome um the nucleolus so in the nucleus the nucleolus is a kind of a darker region so ribosomes which is a form of rna called rrna the r stands for ribosomal ribosomes are the structures that make proteins right and they're going to do that in the cytoplasm but ribosomes are coded for in your dna so ribosomes are made inside the nucleus um, in an area called the nucleolus or nucleolus either pronunciation is fine um, inside the nucleus where ribosomes are made and then they're going to leave the pores to go in the cytoplasm and they're going to function in the cytoplasm to make proteins ribosomes and just just to point out you know this slide's called parts of the eukaryotic cell but whoops sorry just want to remind you all cells have ribosomes okay all cells have ribosomes it's where proteins are made this is translation a whole chapter on that later there's two types, free and bound. Free ribosomes are attached to the substance called the ER, which we'll get to in just a minute. Free ribosomes are bound, or not, not bound, they're just suspended in the cytoplasm. Um, this picture, you can see this like long thread-like thing is a cross-section of ER. You can see some ribosomes are stuck to it and some ribosomes are not. Um, in a bacteria, you know, bacteria have ribosomes. A bacteria, because they don't have organelles, bacterial ribosomes are all free ribosomes. Ribosomes that are bound will be bound to the ER, which would have to be a eukaryotic cell. Both kinds of ribosomes make proteins. So why do you need to have both? Well, ribosomes that are free usually are making proteins that are meant to stay inside the cell. Ribosomes that are bound usually make proteins that are meant to go into the ER, where they're going to be stored and shipped and processed, which prime means they're going to be exported or they're going to be leaving the cell. So free ribosomes usually make proteins the cell wants to keep for itself. Bound ribosomes usually make proteins that the cell is going to export. An example would be insulin. Cells of your pancreas make insulin. Insulin's a protein, it's a hormone, right? That's meant to go into your blood. Um, the cell doesn't want to keep it. I mean, if it's storing it, fine, but it's going to eventually export it, right? So insulin is going to be made by a ribosome that's bound. The endomembrane system is just a fancy word for all the organelles that can swap out membranes. Uh, the nucleus ER, Golgi, lysosomes, vacuoles, the cell membrane. Um, basically, the endomembrane system, any of these membranes can pinch off and fuse with another organelle that's on the list. So a piece of membrane that's part of the ER could eventually become part of the Golgi, which could fuse with the cell membrane. All right. Um, membranes can be swapped in and out. Notice what is not on the list, mitochondria and chloroplasts, not on this list. Those have membranes, but those are not part of the endomembrane system, they are separate. Um, vesicle is just what you call, you know, take a, a piece of membrane, pinch it off into a nice sphere, you call it a vesicle. It's just a, like a storage little sack. So the ER stands for endoplasmic reticulum. This is sort of like the highway system of a cell. It's basically just a, a series of folded membranes um, they begin at the nucleus, they end at the cell membrane, and when you're in the ER, like, think of it sort of like a, 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 a tube in the cell. When you're in the ER, are you surrounded by cytoplasm? No, you're like embedded in the cytoplasm. The ER is embedded or suspended in the cytoplasm. So think of it like you made a big jello mold with straws in it, and the straws, you can go through the straws without actually being inside the, the, the cytoplasm. Rough and smooth, smooth ER doesn't have ribosomes. Rough ER does have ribosomes. In this picture, you can see both. Here's smooth ER. The ones that are circular, like that right there, that's a cross section of a piece of ER coming toward you. Um, rough ones, little kind of like sandpaper, they have ribosomes. Obviously, your cells have both. Bacteria have neither because they don't have ER. Um, functions of the endomembrane system or of the ER. Smooth ER, now rough ER has ribosomes. Glycoproteins, this word right here, glyco means sugar, proteins is for proteins. These are 
um, proteins attached to carbohydrates, a lot of times they're going to become um, cell surface, cell membrane, little receptors. There can be appendages that are stuck to the cell membrane, usually facing outward. Um, we'll get to why the cell would have those later. Uh, but they're made by rough ER because they have proteins. Smooth ER makes lipids, um, makes carbohydrates, detoxifies drugs and proteins. This third one, the AP exam mentions from time to time. Um, if you take, um, if you drink or if you take Advil, anything that your body doesn't no normally have, your body's going to break it down. Your body's going to detoxify things that should not be there, whether it's a drug or, again, whether it's a, well, Advil is a drug. But, um, Anything for your body is going to try and break down. Smooth ER does detoxification of, of substances. It also stores calcium ions. It's a little jeopardy fact. Rough ER makes glycoproteins, makes transport vesicles, usually transporting proteins, and also makes more, more membrane. Of this slide, the, the detoxifying drugs that smooth ER does that, and that the rough ER make glycoproteins, those are the ones that are most important if you, you, know, if you want to pick just a couple to memorize. Golgi apparatuses with the Golgi bodies, they're basically like you pinched off part of the ER. They look kind of like a stack of pancakes. They're flat membranes. Um, cisternae is just what you call like the space inside the membrane. Um, so say a, a rough or a bound ribosome made a protein went into the ER and the cell just needs to store it or kind of like the UPS store, store it or process it or break it down or whatever. Um, package it, you're going to do that in um, a Golgi body. Golgi bodies, if you look at this picture here, like there's a cis side and a trans side. The cis side receives, the trans side um, ships out. So like this little vesicle that's pinching off the Golgi, contains those two little purple proteins, it's probably going to go fuse with the cell membrane. And when it fuses with the cell membrane, it's going to release whatever's inside the Golgi. Um, cool. Lysosomes. Um, our little sacks of hydrolytic enzymes, they're pretty acidic. Um, if all the lysosomes of a cell were to leak, uh, it would start to digest the cytoplasm, which actually there are times when you might actually want to do that. I'll give you an example in a minute. But um, basically, it's, it's the cell breaking down. Like if you have a mitochondria that doesn't work anymore, you know, the cell doesn't have unlimited resources. You want to take those component parts and break them down. So a lysosome would come fused with the mitochondria and sort of digest it. Phagocytosis is the term for cell eating. Say a cell engulfs a piece of carbohydrate, to break it down, a lysosome would come and fuse with it. Um, you want to keep these enzymes separate because, again, they're hydrolytic. They would break down the cytoplasm. Um, this is just an image of, of, of a food particle coming in and a lysosome coming to break down the food. Um, an example when you would want a cell to do that on purpose, to leak its lysosomes. So the concept of apoptosis, you've probably heard that word before, Apoptosis is programmed cell death when cells are programmed to die. And there's lots of examples of that. The one that I want to mention now is when a tadpole becomes a frog, right? It loses the tail. The tail disintegrates. That's, that's programmed cell death. Those cells are programmed to eventually die. And what happens is the lysosomes inside those cells of the tadpole's tail just burst open. They just leak their enzymes and the cells are digested from the inside out and they die. Um, normally you wouldn't want that, right? But if the cell is programmed to die, that's one way that you could kill the cell. Okay, this just shows um, a vesicle that contains a proxosome, which we'll get to in a mitochondria. Uh, the mitochondria is gonna be broken down. Um, vacuoles are just big storage compartments. Um, usually with vacuoles, you think of plant cells, big central vacuole that stores water. Um, contractile vacuoles are kind of cool. They're like, these are found usually in plants or maybe some kind of little protist um, that pump out excess water, kind of like a drawstring bag with a, like a, if you cinch a bag, um, when you cinch them, they pump out water. So like a freshwater protist that's taking in too much water, a contractile vacuole could pump out the excess water. Um, cool. Big central vacuole. Um, this just reviews the endomembrane system from the nucleus to ER to the Golgi with some vesicles to the plasma or cell membrane. Mitochondria. So mitochondria, um, not part of the endomembrane system, right? All cells um, that are eukaryotic have mitochondria. So plants, animals, fungi, and protists have mitochondria. Bacteria don't. Um, one common mistake the kids make is they don't think plants have mitochondria because, you know, plants have chloroplasts. Well, plants have both. They have mitochondria and chloroplasts. 
So this is the ATP production center of the cell. Interesting fact, mitochondria and chloroplasts, for the record, have their own ribosomes and they have their own DNA. So there is DNA outside the nucleus. There's DNA inside your mitochondria, which is interesting. We'll come back to that in a minute. They also grow and divide on their own. They're almost like bacteria, to be honest. They have a double membrane system too. Um, in class, if we were having this in class, I would have you draw this with me on the board. So if you're doing this in the outline, this is how you draw a, a mitochondria. So you draw like a kidney bean shaped thing like that, the outer membrane. The outer membrane is pretty smooth. Then you draw a second inner membrane that's highly convoluted, all right? Um, the outer membrane is called the outer membrane. The inner membrane is called the inner membrane. That's, that's really easy to remember. Um, the space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix, all right? This word cristae is just what you call these foldings. The word cristae is not that important of a word. The space between the outer and inner membrane is called the inner membrane space. So what you should do is you, sh you should draw a kidney bean. You should draw a second membrane on the inside that's highly folded. Label the innermost area of the matrix, the space between the two membranes, the inner membrane space, and then the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Um, when we do cellular respiration in chapter seven, we're going to come back to structure of a, of a mitochondria. Um, cool. Um, this is a cross section of one. You can see the inner membrane space. You can see all the foldings, the cristane. You can see the space in the very middle where the, you know, inside these foldings is called the, the matrix. Okay. All right, cool. Um, and notice mitochondria have ribosomes, which is interesting. Chloroplasts are a family of organelle called plastids. Their job is to do photosynthesis. Um, Chloroplast is just one example, like I say, of, of plastids. Not all plastids have chlorophyll. Some have other pigments that are yellow or red or purple, but chlorophyll is obviously the one that's green. It's one that's probably the most common. They also have their own ribosomes and their own DNA, and they divide on their own, similar to bacteria and, and mitochondria. Um, the structure of a chloroplast, so you know, if we were in class, we'd be drawing this. So you, you, know, you draw a membrane, you just, it can just be like a, an oval. These stacks that look kind of like stacks of green Oreos. Um, the stacks is called a grana. Um, granum is the singular, grana is the plural. The stack is a granum. Each Oreo, which is just a membrane, there's like an Oreo shaped membrane, is called a thylakoid membrane. Um, so a granum is made of thylakoid stacked on top of one another. The fluid surrounding the stacks is called the stroma. Okay. So you have the outer membrane, the inner membrane, they're both smooth. You have the thylakoid membranes on the inside, stacked into grana, or a granum, surrounded by stroma. When we do, um, in chapter eight, when we do photosynthesis, we'll come back to the structure of a chloroplast. Here you can see an, a nice blown up image of that, of that picture. Okay. Um, here you can see this is an algal cell that's been dyed with stains that fluoresce. You can see the little green chloroplast. So this is a super duper, super, super duper import, important concept. We're gonna come back to this several times throughout the year called the endosymbiotic theory. So this is a theory that tries to explain where mitochondria and chloroplasts came from. And because they're so similar to bacteria and there are other bits of evidence, this, this is a very solid idea. Um, people think that the ancestors of bacteria, of, I'm sorry, the ancestors of uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts once lived on their own and that they were kind of like bacteria. Mitochondria would be bacteria that could make lots of ATP, which is great, and chloroplasts would be, would be bacteria that could do photosynthesis, all right? And the idea here is that it, you know, the ancestral eukaryotic cell engulfed those, probably because it wanted to eat them, and it didn't eat them, and it was a mutualistic relationship where the ancestral mitochondria and chloroplasts got housing, they got protection, from a larger cell, and then the host got glucose from the chloroplast and got ATP from the, from the mitochondria. It's called the endosymbiotic theory. Um, of note, mitochondria and chloroplasts today cannot survive on their own. If you just took them out of a cell, they would, they would decompose. Um, the ancestors of them, people think, could live on their own. And the fact that they have their own DNA, they have their own ribosomes, they divide on their own, um, they're about the same size as bacteria. All that leads credence to the idea 
that um, the ancestors of mitochondria and chloroplasts were once independent. Um, this image, and we're gonna see this image again later, shows like the evolution of the eukaryotic cell where you have the ancestor, they engulfed a mitochondria. Now it's not, it's not a mitochondria like today it would be the ancestor of mitochondria. Then later they engulf chloroplast and this would be the ancestor of, of plants and animals right here. We're gonna come back to this topic later because this is a super important topic. The AP exam loves asking about the endosymbiotic theory, so you for sure need to know this one. Okay, continuing, peroxisomes. There's times in the cell's life when it needs to produce hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which you don't just want that floating around willy-nilly in the cytoplasm. So an organelle called a peroxisome is a storage compartment for hydrogen peroxide. Um, um, this just shows a peroxisome engulfing a mitochondria that it's gonna break down. It's probably a mitochondria that doesn't work anymore. The cytoskeleton is just a network of fibers throughout the cell. It's kind of like a cell scaffolding that helps keep the cells shape. It can help anchor it to either other cells or to a, a surface. The cytoskeleton in mitosis is gonna become the mitotic spindle. You know, when we do prophase, metaphase, and all that stuff that forms that spindle. So this is gonna be important later also. Um, one thing that's kind of cool, the cell has proteins called motor proteins that can walk down the cytoplasm um, using ATP. I mean, they're really cool. You can like watch them like, almost like an inchworm, walk down. And if you attach a vesicle to them, you can move things throughout the cytoplasm by having them walk down the, the uh, cytoskeleton. Um, this is from your book. There's three kinds of, of um, parts of the cytoskeleton, microtubules, microfilaments, and inter intermediate filaments. You do not need to know this for the AP exam, but it's interesting just to kind of read them because some of the structures are just incredibly complex. I mean, it's it's, it's like molecular architecture. It's really, it's just elegant in the, in the beauty of how these um, filaments and tubules are, are made by the cell. The cell wall, so just make sure we note, animal cells, no cell wall, right? Plants have cell walls, bacteria can, fungi can, some protists can. Um, the cell wall is not like flexible, it's very sturdy. So it like helps the plant grow, you know, upright toward the sun. Um, and it helps the cell maintain its shape. Um, plant cell walls are made of cellulose. If you think back to chapter three, fungal cell walls are made of chitin, that uh, polysaccharide that people always mispronounce chitin, it's actually chitin. Um, it helps maintain the shape and provide support for the cell. Um, a cell membrane being flexible can, can burst. If a cell gets too much water, the cell membrane can burst. The cell wall can't really burst because it's more of a solid structure. Um, one thing to note, so this just shows an animal cell. So this is inside the cell. This is the plasma membrane. The extracellular fluid, the stuff around the animal cell can have lots of cool stuff in it. This shows some collagen fibers and some other filaments that are helping to anchor um, the cell to either other cells or to, you know, a, a, a cell surface. You know, the, the cells of my pancreas don't just leave my pancreas and wander throughout my blood. The cells of my pancreas stay in my pancreas because they're bathed by this extracellular fluid. In your body, you might call it interstitial fluid, the fluid between your cells um, or between your tissues. Um, yeah, we'll come back to more of that later, but just re recognize here that there is stuff outside the cell um, in the extracellular fluid. Um, on this slide, this is a lot of words. Most of these words are not that important. So cells like to be attached to one another, and sometimes there's junctions between cells. The word that's bold, plasma desmata. This word, plasma desmata, are picture like two plant cells, like rectangular shaped cells. Um, there could be little like doorways between the cells, like gaps between the two cell walls that allows like water to go from one plant cell to the next plant cell, which would be more efficient than water having to leave one cell and come in the next cell. Um, plasma desmata are like little channels between cells, plant cells that allow things to pass between the two cytoplasms. And animal cells, things like tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions are just things that either adhere the cells together or allow things to go from cell to cell. The word plasma desmata, you should memorize. That's a word that the AP exam expects you to know. If you see tight junctions, desmosomes, or gap junctions, just think those are found in animal cells, not plant cells. And that's just the same picture, bigger. 
So last slide, we went through this fast, but I think we got it. We definitely got it done in one video. So the, the chapter ends with just the point that the cell is more than the sum of its parts, as are you. You're more than the sum of your parts. You're not just a big bag of carbon and water. Um, all of the parts of a cell work together to give the cell its functionality. All right, this shows a, a macrophage, which is a cell that can engulf and digest um, foreign invaders like bacteria or viruses. All the parts of a cell work together um, to give the cell its personality, to give the cell its function, to give it, it its order. Um, like any organism, you know, you're more than the sum of your, of your organs. Um, the cell is more than the sum of its parts, all right? There are emergent properties that arise when the organelles work together. Okay, that was fast, but that was good. Um, I hope that was helpful, and I will see you guys next time.